Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to Pilgrim Church, uh, Christian Education. Today we are having a, a continuing uh, uh, talk from Wilbert and Gloria uh, on the fifth stream, and I'm sure they'll introduce it better than that. But uh, we are live uh, streaming. This is our, our new experience here with uh, uh, live streaming our adult education courses. So please enjoy. You can find the previous uh, section online. And I'll, without further ado. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Reverend Dr. Yvonne Delk begins the first chapter of the book by saying, to remember is to define who we are in ways that we are not free to walk away from. Remembering is a sacred liturgy that grounds and equips us with an identity, meaning, and purpose. It is the connection to all life, the living and the dead and the not yet born. James Weldon Johnson put pen to paper calling African people to never forget their story, their journey, and the place where they first met the divine. Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our god true to our native land for decades new united church of christ members have typically learned about four streams that form the denomination congregational christian evangelical and reform. But there is a fifth stream just as strong that has usually not been named. In October 2022, the UCC Historical Council finally voted to recognize that fifth stream, the Afro-Christian tradition, as separate from and equal to the other four. Reverend Delk noted that full recognition for the Afro-Christian convention separate from the wider Christian stream is not about the past, it's about the present and the future, but it's also about exposing what she describes as a false line. The predominantly white UCC since its formation in 1957 has tended to regard Afro-Christian churches as, in Delt's words, an object of the UCC's mission rather than a subject that could inform its mission. This book was written and published to tell and institutionalize the story of the Afro-Christian Convention stream. They chose to tell this story by the Afro-Christian Convention in an African worldview. Where and how this root is nurtured then shapes identity, affirmations, theology, expectations, experiences, and organizational structure. This is a story of an African people as represented in their name, Afro-Christian. It is the story of a spiritual people rooted in a belief that individuals and the community were continuously involved with the spirit world. This is the story of an Ubuntu people rooted in community, kinship, family. I am because we are, since we are, therefore I am. This is a story of people who appropriated the Christian gospel to itself, took on the cardinal principles of the Christian church, and articulated it as its relevance to our own freedom struggle. More specifically about our storytellers, the authors of this book, are witnesses to this story and legacy. Three of the writers, Reverend Vivian Lucas, Reverend Dr. Yvonne Delk, and Reverend Kay Hill write from their perspectives of their roots in the Afro-Christian Convention. Three of the writers, Dr. Julia Speller, Reverend Brenda Square, and Reverend Dr. Henry T. Simmons, write from their experiences as members of black congregational churches. It's important to know who is telling the story because this book is not an intellectual thesis of the Afro-Christian Convention. It is written from a deeply subjective perspective, and what they share in large part depends on where they are sitting 
in the heart of this story as it unfolds. So each of them begins by writing their writing, by naming how and where they enter the story. And I would like to briefly do the same. I was baptized and confirmed on the same day at First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Glen Ellen. That's also the church where Bruce and I were married and where our oldest child, Jonathan, was baptized as a baby. But my spiritual roots were planted by my parents in the faith traditions that were planted by our ancestors when they were growing up in Mississippi. On my father's side, our family's home church is Greater Damascus Church of Christ Holiness, USA, in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. Greater Damascus is celebrating its 160th anniversary this year. My great aunt, Ora Lee, who transitioned in 2020, gave her life to the Lord at the age of 10 during a revival in October 1929 at Greater Damascus. And over the years, whenever we go back to Hazelhurst, that's where our family worships. My strongest roots that were planted in birth and nurtured through my adolescence were fed by my Aunt Mary, or Eldress Mary Mullen, as she was known, at the Church of the Living God in Champaign-Urbana that she pastored from 1967 to 1981. For a variety of reasons, I spent many of my summers and school breaks with my aunt and uncle, and during those times, I was basically a pastor's kid. My tap roots are in the Southern Black Church tradition. I was an active participant in First Congregational Church as a youth, uh, and after seminary, I chose to pursue ordination in the UCC with the support of my Pilgrim family. I'm a proud member of the UCC. But it was also important to me to include in my ordination paper the milestone of when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, even though wise counsel suggested it might provoke awkward questions in the review committee. Reverend Dr. J. Taylor Stanley chronicled the history of the Black congregational and Afro-Christian churches between 1865 and 1975, characterizing them as two separate sources in parallel streams. For the Black Congregationalists, their source was the New England tradition and ethos introduced through schools and churches created by the American Missionary Association. They traced their lineage to the English settlers who came to North America on the Mayflower, and they modeled New England worship and polity. The Afro-Christian source was the frontier revivalism and conversion experiences of the Great Awakenings in the 18th and 19th centuries. Marked by a series of camp meeting revivals from Cambridge, Kentucky, across the Appalachian Mountains to the Tidewater regions of Virginia and North Carolina. Following emancipation, many blacks in the growing Christian movement left the racial restrictions of white Christian churches to form their own independent congregations and conferences. They called themselves Afro-Christian. Thinking about the first stream, the Congregational stream, the American Missionary Association had a strong influence on the way in which the black congregational churches evolved. From a positive perspective, they provided support for newly freed women and men through schools and churches. At the same time, they also sought ways to reverse the strong impact of rural black religion. They supported an elite, educated black middle class that could intelligently receive and model congregationalism for black churches and communities. An article published in the magazine, The Congregationalist, in 1868 described such black congregational churches as a controlling power in a dark land. Assuming an attitude that today would be described as imperialistic and paternalism, the AMA missionaries devalued the religious culture of African Americans in the rural South. Church leaders and members embraced the ethos and polity of the New England con congregationalism, crafting a self-identity that they believed would help them cope with the difficulties of being black in this majority white nation. The development of the Afro-Christian Convention followed a very different path. Providence Church in Chesapeake, Virginia, dedicated in 1854, was said to be the first black Christian denomination church 
It was composed of free and formerly enslaved Africans who left white Christian churches. And it was fueled by an undeniable zeal for the gospel. Fueled by that zeal, the number of Afro-Christian churches grew very rapidly despite limited financial support. Within three years, there were 69 churches, 33 ministers, and 18 licensates were reported. In 1892, paralleling the structure of the white Christian body, these conferences consolidated to become the Afro-Christian Convention. By 1900, the Afro-Christian Convention assumed the form and function of other Protestant denominations. They met biannually, had a publishing house, and established divisions of Christian education, women's auxiliaries, local and foreign missions. They were a legitimate denomination. Their commitment to the theology and doctrinal principles of the Christian denomination, however, did not erase the experiences of separation and exclusion practiced by the broader church. And this became the foundation for a fierce spirit of Afro-Christian independence. The Afro-Christian churches in the Tidewater regions developed their own idiom, style of preaching, liturgy, and worship, where God's word through music, preaching, and prayer became central, and verbal and physical affirmations through amens and shouting during worship became prominent. And unlike their black congregational counterparts, they shared the Christian connection proclivity to resist formally taught theology and doctrine. Now this was interpreted by some scholars as an anti-intellectual bias. However, Nathan O. Hatch in his book, The Democratization of American Christianity, characterized this stance as a reforming posture that sought to give laity and clergy equal footing in congregational life, called for a new view of history that placed innovation over tradition, and encouraged a popular hermeneutic that allowed persons to understand and interpret the New Testament in their own ways. Thus, the successors of the Christian connection, both black and white, affirmed that the church's relationship with God was based on a personal theology and religious experience. This focus on practical application connected very strongly with the Afro-Christian passion for education that was realized in the formation of Franklinton Christian College. It was the Afro-Christian's commitment to education, despite many setbacks, that signaled strong resilience and self-determined response to what it would mean to be black and Christian in a majority white and congregational denomination. So in 1931, the congregational and Christian churches merged, bringing together the black constituents in their midst. Unfortunately, the planners of the merger gave little or no thought to the diversity that existed among the black constituents. In 1936, black members of the Congregational and Christian Churches in the South became part of the Southeastern District of the Congregational Christian Churches. And the churches were then encouraged to organize into sensible conference units, which basically resulted in racially segregated conference structure, and one by one, the white conferences withdrew. By 1949, the black churches in the Southeastern District were isolated from their white counterparts. So in 1950, the remaining groupings of black congregationalists and Afro-Christians combined to form, to create the Convention of the South, a new denomination, denominational entity uh, which existed through the early years of the UCC. Although the number of Afro-Christian congregations outnumbered that of their congregational cousins, there was an unspoken expectation that the congregational rather than the Christian tradition should be the gold standard for all black churches. The creation of the Convention of the South was a logical solution for the predominantly white denominational planners, but created different expectations and questions about the meaning and belonging. So for the black congregationalists, it created the question, what does it mean to be black <clears throat> in a majority white denomination? And for the Afro-Christian, it created the question, what does it mean to be black and Christian in the midst of a majority white congregationalism? 
Psalm 33, one through three. Praise to the creator and preserver. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise is becoming and appropriate for those who are upright in heart, those with moral integrity and godly character. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Sing praises to him with the harp of 10 strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with a loud and joyful sound. fully understand and appreciate the tension created by the Afro-Christian stream flowing into the UCC and the challenge it presented to its members, it's important to understand when the UCC was formed. Three years after the Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education ruled that separate but equal public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Three years after the four students at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical College sat down in protest at the whites only lunch counter on a Woolworths department store in Greensboro, North Carolina. One year after the 1956 bus boycott of African American citizens in Montgomery, Alabama that toppled racially segregated seating on that city's buses. The UCC's founding synod took place just six years after the horrific bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church by Ku Klux Klan members in Birmingham, Alabama, which killed four black girls moments after they had finished Sunday school class. And the UCC was eight years old when Bloody Sunday took place during the first Selma to Montgomery March an event that prompted passage of the federal 1965 Voting Rights Act. When the UCC was formed would determine how the Afro-Christian Afro Convention would be related to. Because the UCC had to grapple with tensions arising from persistent racial injustice in the wider society and its own life. Within the UCC, assimilation of black churches appeared to be the desired goal. Though Afro-Christian local churches outnumbered historically black congregational churches, even upon entering the UCC in 1957, the history and beliefs of the former were less noted than the latter. Effectively, the Afro-Christian convention history and contributions to the union were tucked into hiding from the very start. In the latter half of the 1960s, the Black Power, Black Pride movement shifted the focus, though, from integration and assimilation to liberation. The assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April 1968 drew into question the view that nonviolent resistance was the most effective means to end Jim Crow laws and secure lasting racial justice. The period of enormous social upheaval challenged black people of faith to examine their unique mission and purpose. A more proactive embrace of Afrocentrism was encouraged. Now, of course, this impact was felt by blacks who were members of predominantly white mainline Protestant churches. In 1967, the UCC formed the Committee for Racial Justice, now, that gained more influence at the 1969 General Synod in Boston, where a number of black clergy stopped the Synod's business agenda and demanded that James Foreman be granted time to present to the plenary the Black Manifesto on, on behalf of the Black Economic Development Conference. In 1969, the UCC Commission for Racial Justice, or CRJ as it's known, was established as a recognized national instrumentality to address racism in the church and wider society. In 1971, the United Black Christians of the UCC were organized under CRJ's leadership as a principally black, laity-led, historically underrepresented group in the UCC. Clergy and laypersons in the Afro-Christian convention lineage formed the majority of the membership and assumed major leadership roles in these groups, giving visibility and voice to the UCC's black constituency. 
The power of this new sense of self among people of African ancestry was highlighted by the emergence of the Black Theology Movement, an interdenominational organization founded in 1976. Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright was on the board of this, this uh, project as well. Amen. Here, here. The Black Theology Project incorporated black ac academics, theologians, clergy and laity, and political and community activists committed to theological reflection and social action on behalf of the black church and black community. Now in 1977, as the UCC marked its 20th anniversary, the denomination's commitment as a multiracial, multicultural, justice for all church was again challenged. How would the goal of diversity be realized without expecting blacks and other historically underrepresented groups to abandon their rich histories and traditions? A marker that most distinguished churches in Afro-Christian convention from others in the UCC including historically black congregational churches was, you guessed it, it's worship style. Amen. Overtly spirit-filled worship was not generally encouraged and certainly not embraced by black congregationalists who sought to emulate their white kindred in Christ in their style of worship. However, the increasingly proactive affirmation of the values of Afrocentrism that arose in the 1970s in society opened the way to more proudly extol the worship styles of historically black churches. The Afro-Christian Convention worship style eventually even impacted UCC General Synod worship life. And many people have, who've gone to Synod have reflected on, Synod worship seems to be different from our regular worship. In the 1970s, CRJ and United Black Christians held shared worship services after the opening nights of Synod to celebrate the, denom celebrate the denomination's black constituency and to evoke spiritual strength and determination to advocate for issues of justice on the Synod's agenda. Attendance by non-blacks at these soulful celebrations increased with each succeeding Synod. They found out where they were being held and they started showing up. And eventually, it influenced synod worship to become more multiracial and interculturally inclusive. So the influence on the, UC, of, on the UCC of the African Christian Convention's worship traditions enabled the UCC to sing a new song. Using a global lens, this chapter of the book, chapter eight, highlights several examples which speak to the impact the spirit in the Afro-Christian church has had and it's returning to the source of a larger black sacred cosmos. Here are two of these examples. Reverend Albert Clage Jr., pastor of Central United Church of Christ in Detroit, friend and colleague of Malcolm X, brought to clear light the proclamation of the Black Messiah, a watershed event. Clage preached, when I say Jesus was black, that Jesus was the Black Messiah, I'm not saying, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus was black? Or, let's pretend that Jesus was black. Or, it's, necessarily, it's necessary psychologically for us to believe that Jesus was black. I'm saying Jesus was black. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Cleage's arguments were based on Jesus' genealogy and bloodlines, the ethnic geopolitical realities of the Bible, and the diversity of humankind created by God. It was Cleve's identity as a black nationalist that compelled him to conduct a quest for an ethnically black Jesus because a non-black Jesus would have forced him to make a choice between nationalism and Christianity, his blackness and his religion. A second example, in 1971, the UCC sent Benjamin Chavez, who had once worked as an assistant to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to work with the students struggling to enforce school integration. He met with students regularly at Gregory Congregational Church to discuss black history, as well as to organize a boycott. After a white-owned store was firebombed, Chavez and nine others were arrested on false charges of arson, and he was incarcerated for three years. When he was released, he continued the good fight for liberation and freedom, and in the early 1980s, he had turned his work to organizing in Warren County, North Carolina, to prevent dumping of toxic materials in a landfill. 
Out of this movement, he coined the term environmental racism. In 1982, after a four-year struggle to prevent soils contaminated with PCBs from being buried in a local landfill, the police removed 67 protesters and arrested 55 of them. Chavez's position was that the issue of environmental racism is an issue of life and death. It is not just an issue of some form of prejudice where someone doesn't like you because of the color of your skin. By 1987, Chavez was heading up the UCC Commission for Racial Justice, which issues the historic report, Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. And in October 1991, Ben Chavez and others convened the first national people of color environmental leadership summit in Washington, DC, out of which came 17 principles of environmental justice. These principles laid the foundation for environmental work at the United Nations. And you may have guessed this by now, but a third example of the impact of the gift of the spirit of the Afro-Christian Convention is Trinity United Church of Christ, the largest congregation in the United Church of Christ. This congregation was born in 1961 in the background of a new fledgling domination, denomination seeking to attract new members based on a model of class elitism with an urban rising middle class and housing integration and flight. In many ways, its history modeled, mirrored the conflicting class narratives between the Afro-Christian and Christian congregational churches. By 1971, the congregation claimed its identity as unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. In 1972, Trinity began its trajectory of an African-centered Christian witness in the spirit of Afro-Christian churches under the leadership of Reverend Dr. John Jeremiah Wright. Trinity became a living prophetic witnessing church with a worship style undeniably African in spirit, a relational disposition in the fullest definition of community engagement, a transcendent ecumenicism, and a commitment to dialogue and ministry partnership across faith traditions that was local, national, and global. The concluding chapter of the book, chapter nine, is written by Mother Delk, who birthed and edited this story. I want to share excerpts of her closing thoughts in her words. The church is not static. We are a people, a church and a people who are on a journey from fragmentation to wholeness, from slavery to freedom, from innocence to maturity, from the despair of our past to the promise and hope of our future. The church at every stage of its life believed the dreamers would have to chart a way of living and existing in uncertain and anxious times. The story of the Afro-Christian convention is not simply a story about the past, it is about the journey of a people walking by faith and with faith in uncertain and anxious times. The Afro-Christian Convention is the story of our God who is constantly renewing. This is a narrative of God, this is a narrative of God flowing through the lives of a people, creating life out of death, bringing forth order out of chaos, and making a path through deserts and valleys. The Afro Christian Convention is the story of our God who is constantly renewing. I think I just read that. The Afro Christian tradition is deeply rooted in liberation and freedom. The mothers and fathers of the fifth stream possessed a deep and abiding faith in God, a wonder working God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ for liberation and from every bondage. It was God's spirits moving forth in them and through them that guided and sustained them in difficult times. It was the spirit that sustained them through every trial and tribulation, every mountain and valley. It was the spirit that empowered them with the strength to keep on keeping on, even when they could not see the way. Empowered and infused by the spirits, others' definitions could not contain them. Imposed limitations could not imprison them. It is our spirituality that show, that allowed us age after age and generation after generation to do more than survive, but to press on against a bitter wind to do the work our souls required. The mothers and fathers from this tradition entered the United States in 1619 
at Fort Monroe in Virginia as human cargo. Captured on the high seas during the transatlantic slave trade, this predates the arrival of the Puritans in 1628. The UCC Historical Council has officially added this story to the curriculum of the UCC history, doctrine, and polity. It further advocate, advocates for the support and expansion of the Afro-Christian archive housed at Franklinton Center at Bricks in North Carolina. This story was written in the hope that out of the acts of God in the history of an African people, the United Church of Christ will be inspired to live out its life with renewed commitment to spirit, to justice, to liberation, and to becoming the beloved community. As we look back to see who we have authentically been, we also lean forward into whom we are authentically becoming. So to summarize, the Afro-Christian Convention, the fifth stream of the UCC, is an ever-flowing tributary that is ever-renewing in our call to pursue justice and seek spiritual transformation. Thank you. And so now we have time for questions or discussion. Or we could just leave and go to church. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first, but how did, anybody? This could be a question for anybody. It's just me thinking. How do how do you see the Afro Christian Convention flowing into? What are some of the um, signs, or what is, what can you point to to say I'm not like getting the right words here? But 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 how do you see that flowing through the whole of UCC? And I think again, that's not just for you. They know they have an answer for themselves. It's not a. It's just the way it is. I'm just curious. I think it's I think it's flowing through, but I think um, to be fair, one one stream flowing into four other streams, uh, five. I mean, it's it, it's not necessarily going to be as visible as as if it had stayed independent. Um, I think that some of the, I, I love the part about the, the synod worship because I do feel like when I go to synod, I experience the UCC in a different way than I experience it, than anyone can experience it in any single location. And, and part of that's because each church has a, a sort of a dominant stream, if you will, out of, out of the five. And, and to be honest, again, some didn't even know the fifth one existed, so they didn't even know how to honor it. Um, I, I think, in, as we talked a little bit about last week, I think that the um, I think the Afro-Christian stream, one of my interpretation of a gift of the Afro-Christian stream, it is not in the book, actually part of it might be, we talked about last week, is to, um, while I feel some of the streams were focused on comforting the afflicted, I think that the Afro-Christian stream helps to afflict the comfortable. Um, and I think that's the spirit flowing through the African American stream. It's not just because it's a bunch of like people who like to agitate people. I think the Holy Spirit is active, and active is movement, and movement is often not as comfortable as sitting still. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, um, Mark. I think was first, um, and then. So um, that sounds should... like the Community Renewal Society is one of those yes. bodies yes. that stirs the comfortable. Yes. Was that? Did that was part. Yes, that was. The history of that? Uh, it, they talk about it in the book. It is very much related to the UCC and the justice work that was being done in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. They, so there's that is a close correlation. Did it come out of the black church? Yes, I think the black church and what was going on in the black community in Chicago okay. at the time. Yes. Now you go to synod. I think every time, right? What? How was Trinity? Received? Does it have a big footprint um, on the national scale? Or? Hmm. Um. I, you know, it's not it's not singled out as special. Um. In, in I mean, um, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss the Third is a very large presence. Um. And but he is not 
Trinity. Dr. Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright was a very large presence, but he was not Trinity. Um, former President Barack Obama went to Trinity, but he was not Trinity, although he did help put it on the national stage. And one would argue, I think Trinity would argue, and, and even um, a former president would argue, that the Trinity helped fed his spirit and shape his worldview, as church tends to, to do for people. Um, the Afro-Christian convention, in, in, is, is the, the spirit of that is larger, so large, I would say, and, and Joyce and you've been, I, when we're there, I, I feel the spirit of that, but I don't, I don't know if any of those people go to Trinity. I have no idea. Right, but there are many people who are there um, who this is the place where they, they can commune and they can feed their spirit when that may not happen on a weekly basis where they are. In congregation, um, other other there are several still. Um, uh, African American women in ministry is another one that does that, and we meet like there. We have a chapter in Chicago, but we also meet at Synod. So there are bodies. The the, the this is still a predominantly white mainline Protestant denomination. Spoiler alert on that one. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so oftentimes the way in which it shows up, and, and Synod is a gathering, and so people from different streams can come together and make a whole pond there in a way in which you can't really do when you're just, you know, out in the wild. I think everyone appreciates the, uh, the history of, of Trinity, and uh, some are aware of its influence. And, and especially in regards to the, uh, the Afro-Christian convention. I, I do get a sense the few times that I've been to Senate that there, uh, there's a desire for a greater presence of Trinity at, yeah. Yeah, I, that's a, good, a great point. I would say that one of the parts that Trinity has carried on is the, um, as, as was mentioned in the book, the Afro-Christian convention um, sense of independence. And um, and I I feel very strongly when I visit Trinity that um, they are they are very proud they there is no they are not hidden and they're not interested in being hidden and if you're not interested in seeing them just don't look that is not their concern right I mean they are un unashamedly and unapologetic right and so I think they represent and that can feed the spirit as well right because sometimes if you're used to spending a lot of your time assimilating it's a little hard to find your voice and so you go to a place where your voice is the voice and your voice is fed and that i think is part of this fact um which i think uh which my colleague here added this this notion of the the ever renewing us in our call to pursue justice and seek spiritual transformation, right? It's, it's, ever, it's ever challenging us and ever encouraging those of all types who don't feel like maybe I am the picture perfect model of whatever is, is presented in my denomination in any way to show up and stand up and speak up. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, um, at Trinity, one of the things I've noticed over the years since I've been sort of involved with um, just the Illinois Conference, they don't seem to have a larger presence in the annual celebrations as they used to or in my earlier days. You know, that have uh, dwindled quite a bit from what I've noticed. That is true. <laughs> Sally. <laughs> Lots of people with their hands up. Given the um, resistance that uh, Afro Christian worship style has experienced in the UCC, what would you say that congregations and people who come out of that tradition get from the UCC? Why do they stay with the UCC? Speaking on behalf of all of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, my my guess would be just from talking to different people, right? My my guess would be that the um, the UCC's uh, 
interest and, and commitment from the very beginning, even from the American Missionary Association, commitment to social justice, commitment to all of those things is what, that's what, what keeps people together. There's also, um, and I would say it's interesting because um, a, a couple of the things that we attended with Mother's Health, I think she would say, some days I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but she says, so, but they're committed to unity and this feeling, again, going back to that African spirit, you can't just walk away, right? So to the point that you raised that I, I thought I got away from, but I'll just go back to what Joyce said. Trinity is part of the UCC. They are proud to be part of the UCC, but they are going to add what they want to to the UCC. And if you want them to be someone different, I don't think they're particularly interested in what in, in doing that, right? Because then that maybe diminishes the, the value. So we can be in unity and we can work together on something, but we don't have to agree on everything and, uh, and we don't have to just make each other happy in order to do that, in order to do that work. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't like you, that doesn't mean I don't want to be part of you or any of those sorts of things. It just means, you know what, I, I'm just going to do my thing. And that's what I thought was interesting about the worship that they started. We're not going to try and change your worship, we're just going to have our worship over here. And when you want to come to our worship, we don't say, you have your worship over there. We say, welcome to our worship. Uh, oh my goodness, Wilbert. Well, I'm going to add from my perspective also that uh, I have stayed uh, because there is an element of uh, black theology, specifically liberation theology, where in liberation theology, uh, there is an emphasis on the church has a responsibility to be a part of social justice. Mm -hmm. And for me, the fact that Pilgrim and other UCC churches, uh, for the most part, are very committed to, to that social justice aspect, that has kept me, uh, especially as being the double, at least, minority. So. Mm -hmm. What you say? Oh, hold on a second. Let's go to somebody who hasn't spoken yet, and I think you're, are you pointing at Jane Ann? Okay. One of the uh, saddest uh, uh, things that I learned about uh, the history of Trinity was that when uh, Jeremiah Wright was first trying to find the money for the building and went to the UCC, they said, oh, that won't work. We can't do that. We can't support you. And he had to get funding elsewhere. I think that was an example of white supremacy of, of, of a, um, a white cloud that prevented uh, people to see the, the wonderful possibility. So um, that uh, should um, make all of us who are white hesitate and look very carefully through the clouds to see what the possibilities are. The other thing I wanted to mention is that in an early synod in St. Louis, uh, Bill and I were at that time living near Washington, D.C., where there were a number of black laymen and black clergy in the Potomac Association. And they had decided that there had never been a black person on the Board of Trustees, the, the council that made the decisions uh, between senators, and they said, we are going to get a black person on. And so we were set to uh, going from delegate to delegate saying, this is an important decision to make, and we succeeded. The, de 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 the delegates voted uh, to bring a black person on to that. And I think that shows us uh, how we have to proceed. Because there are going to be other things, some identified, some not yet identified. And we're all just going to have to get to the delegates and, and mm -hmm. uh, enlighten them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I found myself being a little lost between the two different African, um, I don't know, directions. The one that was more congregational and the one that was more Afrocentric. 
Um, did they merge at some point, or did we still have the two? Yeah. So, so they did merge. Um, they uh, they were merged, and then um, they they basically they uh, when the Congregationalists and the Christian Church came together because those, when I remember the, the four streams, it was Congregationalists, Evangelical, Reformed, and uh, the Christian Churches. And the Congregational and the Christian Churches came together. The Christian Churches um, had uh, an Afro, some African centric people in there, and they had some white people in there. When the Congregational Church and the Christian Church came together, they had the idea that the Congregationalists said, we have some black folks, and the Christian people said, we have some black folks, and they said, well, we should put those black folks together because we don't have a lot of them. And then that, that would be, we will have like, that the, the black folks under each of them would be sort of under one house, if you will, under one, one roof. Um, but they were different. Yeah. And, and um, I would dare say that uh, today we still struggle sometimes to understand that all people who are not like me, aren't even necessarily like each other either. <laughs> um, it seems a simple concept, but it's, it's not necessarily, right? Especially if you're in the main, you think that people who, there's a big group of us and there's like four people over here, we think in groups. So the big group we think is the same and we think the four are the same, but they're not. And so then that, and when the two got together, when the Afro-Christian, um, uh, and the, the black folks and the Afro-Christian and the black folks and the Congregationalists came together, there were differences that were somewhat unrecognized by the larger body, and the, but the larger body looked at the black Congregationalists as the example and said, all of y'all should be like them. I mean, after all, you're all church folks, you're all black folks, why not? <laughs> Yes. I'd like you to say, we've got about three more minutes. Uh, how does the journey continue here at Pilgrim on this, uh, on this, on this journey that we're all on for uh, building a non-racist, uh, anti-racist uh, environment and, and uh, the integration that we're talking about and the celebration of the different things that we do? Can we just talk a little bit about how that journey is going and what our next steps might be? <laughs> in, three in three minutes. Okay, yeah. Um, so, uh, well, I would. I don't have an answer, um, but I would think there's some inspiration that we should ponder from what we learned from our Afro-Christian convention teams and from Mother Delk. Um, one of those is. Um, Persistence. When Jeremiah Wright didn't get the, the money from the build, from the conference, they built the building. I don't know if y'all seen the building. They built the building. They built multiple buildings. They have schools. They were doing a huge amount of wonderful work. And if again, if I don't see that work, that doesn't stop them from doing the work. They're not doing the work for me. They're doing the work because it is the work that they are called to do. And in fact, if I see it and I don't like it. They are still doing the work. They don't stop just because I don't like it, I didn't join in, I criticized it. Amen. So I think that for all of those people, for all of us on the journey here, um, we can't wait for 100% approval. Everybody's not gonna be on the journey. It's not gonna happen. This is the UCC. We're not all everywhere at the same time and that's, that's part of who we are and part of what's beautiful. We're not, so you can't wait for everybody. I think there's a lesson in here about persistence in the spirit and listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is disruptive. The Holy Spirit will call you to do things that you weren't gonna do on your own. Amen. Amen. If you let it, if you listen, the Holy Spirit is there and present, you can ignore it and, and that's fine. I mean, the Holy Spirit's not gonna seek you out. <laughs> so I think if we listen to that movement and the third part um, to me is the, the willingness to be uncomfortable. Um, we as uh, Oak Park, we as whoever the, you know we are here, we, we like to be comfortable. We don't like to be uncomfortable. We like everybody to be happy. We want everything to be comfortable. Um, and we would prefer not to change, but we'd like a different outcome. That, those cannot all be true. <laughs> so I think if we seriously, and I do believe we seriously are committed, we have to be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit, take a risk. No, it's not that risky because we're all in it together. 
Um, and I think the last thing I would just mention is something that, that Wilbert brought up last week um, when, and when we were going through the first part. Some parts of the UCC weren't, they weren't all in, but they formed committees. And we might say all you did was form a committee, but you know what, they formed a committee, they empowered that committee, they gave that committee money, and they might have said, I'm not too sure about this, but I think that the spirit is moving for you to do something, and I'm been moved to support that. So maybe, you know, criticize and critique, critique, critique less, lean in more, be a little bit more open. And that might help us on our journey. Amen. Thank you all for coming. And uh, do you want to give an ad for next week? I don't know what's happening next week. No, we're done. Okay. Come back next week. <laughs>